الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mention, grant peace and send his blessings and his salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I'll swim but won't get wet I know the title is like, what is, this, what is going on in this world? This guy just gets worse and worse. With every title, we get more confused. Exactly. Thank you very much. And inshallah, as long as we're alive, we will continue to create titles that will leave you wondering what in the world is he going to speak about. There's a benefit behind that. But I'm sure you want to know what the topic is. So let me give you the introduction. Uh, it is understandable how the shaitan is constantly devising all types of plans. The shaitan devises all types of plots, very intelligent, I would say. Wicked schemes and plots to misguide the people from the truth and from the proper understanding of our righteous predecessors. After all, this is his bread and butter. This is his job. Everyone has a job. Shaitan, Satan, Iblis and his children, their job around the clock, 24-7, non-stop, no break, no vacation, no time out, is to make sure that we go to Jahannam with them. So it's understandable that they will exert all types of efforts in the process. And they'll be thinking, coming up with some really wicked stuff. It is their ultimate goal. As sad as this sounds, it is not as sad as knowing that he and his likes managed to do this with the flimsiest of plots and the most illogical ideologies. You expect something big that the average man will get confused and therefore misguided. But something, excuse my language, silly, something flimsy, something that is illogical, yet many people fall into the trap that, that is even sadder than the previous. It is laughable, in fact. A classic example to this argument, which the title of this lecture carries, is I'll swim, but won't get wet. Really, dude? Ha has any one of you ever been swimming? Everyone here has been swimming? Did you get wet? You never, you know, you never went into the water, came out dry. So it's, uh, it's inevitable that if you swim, you will get wet. Uh, needless to say, this expression is an analogy. I'm not referring to the idea of going into a swimming pool or the ocean and swimming and getting wet or not getting wet. I'm referring to another notorious expression that is, that is echoed today by many people involved in da'wah. Irrespective of whether they are scholars, senior scholars, students of knowledge, du'at, public speakers, you name it, the whole list. We hear this message now being echoed over and over again. And that expression is none but take the good and leave the bad. The, the idea of I'll swim but won't get wet is actually representing another principle that is being echoed today. Take the good Leave the bad. Uh, this expression makes sense, by the way, right? In certain limited scopes, for sure. This is why the way it is used and propagated today, however, rarely ever fits into that limitation. If we look at the core and the most fundamental reason behind the misguidance of many Muslims, be it in the matters of knowledge and aqidah, or the matters of sinfulness, and following desires, they are all based on the principle of take the good and leave the bad. But you're saying, wait a second. Are we not supposed to take the good and leave the bad? Yes or no? Okay, I know you're going to get confused now, like wait a second, this guy is tricking us. Are you supposed to take the good and leave the bad? So what's wrong with this then? Where's the issue? If, if in life we're supposed to take the good, leave the bad, where's the issue? Why am I making an issue? Why am I saying that all of the misguidance that the Muslims are going through today is because of the application of this principle of take the good and leave the bad, while in fact you're supposed to take the good and leave the bad? 
Does anyone have any input on this? There are certain degrees to it, depending on your level of knowledge and your understanding. Okay. But I want something specific, something clear to the issue. How about the context? Whenever this expression is used, huh? It is often referring to the idea of exposing oneself to bad and then somehow managing to take the good only and be able to successfully, efficiently, intelligently abandon the bad. This is why we said, I'll swim but won't get wet. I'll swim, it's not like you're looking at the sea and saying, I'll take the good from the sea if some fish jumps out to me, huh? I'll go fry it and eat it and I will leave all the bad. No, no, no. You're going to dive into the water and then you're going to say, but I will make sure that I will not get wet. So how does this work? Today we find ourselves exposing ourselves into all types of bad environments, be it in matters of knowledge or matters of desires, and then somehow we're supposed to just be so slick and knowledgeable and wise and strong in our iman and controlling our desires to be able to take the good and leave the bad. So, the worst part and, and the way this applies, let me just give you how this applies. I'm sorry, I just uh, I skipped a paragraph which is very important. So in matters of knowledge and aqidah, now you're a spectator. Of course we have fans and we have air conditions. And we <laughs> no, we have fans or followers of certain speakers, right? Who, uh, mashallah, cannot see anything in this world besides them. And you have all these spectators now that are engaging the a huge number of speakers that are all online. Such as this, right? Saying you're talking about yourself, surely. Online speakers that you don't have to necessarily meet in real life. And because you have a wide variety, someone tells you, look, just take the good and leave the bad. So you say, okay, alhamdulillah, that sounds good, yallah. I listen to fulan and fulan and fulan and this website go here and there and so on and so forth and ma fi mushkil inshallah I will only take the good and leave the bad we will address this in detail the other thing is we go to environments we put ourselves in a predicament where sinfulness is inevitable then we say uh, it's okay I will manage I will get through like uh, that one Muslim Zallah Khair who asked me in, in Malaysia he said why can't I go to clubs he wanted to, to go to a club so, you know, I would say, what are you going to go do in a club, Akhi? Mop the floor? What are you going to do in a club? Yeah, a Muslim in a club where there are women dancing and alcohol being passed around and people are just out of their minds? What kind of, what kind of environment, how will you manage to lower your gaze and fear Allah in a club? This is the idea. Because they're, they're brainwashed into, Akhi, leave the good, you go to the club and you give da'wah to the drunk man who just fell on the stage. Give me a break, Akhi. this is not an environment or a situation for you to give da'wah. So if you put yourself in this predicament, those who want to get married, they go to a certain level with, with, their, with that lady until you, there's, there's nothing you can do anymore, right? Then you say, no, no, I will manage, Akhi. At some point, you can't manage anything. Then comes the surprise, her father says, no! You're Indian, she's Pakistani. Or we're Pakistani or Indian, or we're Syrian, you're Lebanese, and no, we're Saudi, we're Yemeni, and we go into this racism, mashallah, tabarakallah, that we are very good at, and then we find that this marriage thing falls apart because of nationality, race, passport, you name it. Too tall, too short, too skinny, too fat, all types of criteria. And then what about the two birds which fell in love? Oh, too late now. Then what? Then it gets ugly. From that moment onwards. So you want to go there and you're following the footsteps and then you say, no, I won't do bad. I'll, I'll take the good, leave the bad. It's not going to happen. The shaitan is working around the clock. We seek Allah's refuge. So we're going to break it down. Because whenever these ideas are communicated to us, they're always communicated with an evidence. 
Mind you, the, uh, the Shi'i, the Rafidi will, will cite an evidence. And the Sufi will cite an evidence. And the Ash'ari will cite an evidence. You name it, every Tom, Dick and Harry, and Mustafa Ahmad, Rabia, anyone will usually support his ideology with something from the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is a problem. But we have an additional qualification which is decisive and resolves the matter. Is this citation understood in the same manner by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and those who followed them? If so, ala ras wal ain. If not, jazakallah khair, keep it to yourself, I'm not interested. If it is not in agreement with the way they understood it, then everybody will cite something from the Quran and the Sunnah to support their deviant views. We know that much already. And it's not like we're taken by you know, awe or surprise. Allah told us in the Quran that in the Quran, ayatun mutashabihat, right? Ayat that are ambiguous. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْقٍ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَ وَإِبْتِغَاءَ تَعْوِيدَ Allah already told us, those who will have devious in their heart, they will take the same ayat from the Quran. And they will seek some twisted interpretation and some trials and tribulations among the Muslims. We know that already. No surprise. This is why the only way we can get out of this situation, and people hate this, you know, we've reached a point where when you speak about the way of the Salaf, people now, their ears, you know, their bodies cringe, they can't hear it anymore. So, ah, here we go again with the same kind of, you know, extremism and sectarianism. No. No, this is not one of those. This is not calling to a group. This is not warning against anything. It's not about that. It's about facts, man. There's no way around it. You will never understand Islam and our ummah will never be revived until we go back to that understanding. We've tried everything else since for 1400 years. We've tried everything else. Did any of them work? Nothing works. Nothing works. Look at the infighting and the wars and you name it. Nothing is working and nothing will work. And that's something that Imam Malik and others predicted as per their knowledge Allah gave him, not that they know the unseen. And he said, nothing will rectify the latter part of this ummah except that which rectified the former part. Nothing is going to work. Except understanding this Quran and the Sunnah, not according to my idea and my mazaj and my opinion and my mood. No, it's according to how the companions and those who came after them understood it. And if we understand these same evidences, we will see why they will not be able to go far. So, let us address both aspects and remove the misconception by the will of Allah. First, we'll deal with the idea of vice and desires. It is the idea that since evil is out there, and this is how many parents now use this method of raising their children. Huh? Since evil is out there already, I, cannot, I should not keep my children away from it. Because one day, huh, it's going to pop up in their face and they will not be able to manage, they will not know how to deal with it, so they will go right deep into it and sink right there. So instead, I present it to them and supposedly educate them in the process so that there will be no shock element. They will be ready to deal with the world. While this sounds nice and dandy, the truth of the matter is, it's a very sensitive approach. It's a very risky approach, I would say. And more often than not, the parents fail in being able to gauge at what point do they stop this kind of exposure to this evil. We're not, we are with the idea in a sense that you don't leave your kids in complete, uh, they're oblivion uh, to everything in the world. They're clueless, and then suddenly, really, they, they get introduced to all this stuff. No, you have, you have to introduce this, but via what means? Via what means? When we speak about, and before we go there, the evidence which they use, ironically, is, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ انظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ they say, Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, travel through the land, then observe how was the end of the deniers. So they say, look, Allah is telling us to go around. The same thing, that's why some of the scholars take from this ruling on traveling to countries where 
evil is widespread for tourist, tourism purposes. You just go on as a tourist. If you go on a business trip, that's another story. If you go on for da'wah purposes and your, whatever your situation is, that's also another story. It has its own conditions, but that's another story. But go on there just to hang out. Hang out. And say, I will be fine. Or nothing will touch me. Or I fear Allah. Or this and that. Then this is, some of the scholars use this ayah to explain, or they will use the expa explanation of the ayah by Ibn Kathir and others, that wait a second. The ayah is not telling you to go out there and engage with the stuff. Allah is not inviting you to go to this evil and then take a lesson. Ibn Kathir says, travel in the land and see what, has, what was the end of those who reject the truth, meaning contemplate about yourselves. It doesn't mean you, get, you book a ticket and you fly. Huh? Contemplate about yourselves and think about the afflictions Allah struck the previous nations with those who defied his messengers and denied them. Allah sent torment, afflictions, and punishment on them in this life, as well as the painful torment in the hereafter, while saving his messengers and believing servants. So we see from this that the idea is not the physical travel, it is a matter of contemplation. While we find that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would go to certain towns where the people were destroyed, he would tell the Sahaba to hasten. Don't drink there, don't eat from there, don't stay there. And even if you can't cry, pretend that you're crying. He would hasten through these areas where people were destroyed before. Now people go there for sightseeing. Just want to check it out. See the historical monuments and what have you. Subhanallah. And then the one who thinks he's going to go into the midst of evil and be able to manage. We say, Akhi, are you better than the Prophet ﷺ? Says that he, I have, I have firm deen. If the Messenger of Allah used to make, the most dua I used to make, Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, the one who turns the hearts around, keep my heart firm on your deen. Who are you to say I'm going to be firm on the deen when the Messenger of Allah was asking Allah for that? And Allah says, wala tuzakku anfusakum. Don't praise yourselves. No, no, I'll manage. No, Habibi, you think you will manage. You might manage one, two, three, four, five times and then <laughs> gone with the wind. So you don't put yourself there and say, I will take the good and leave the bad. Very often you will do this for so long before the bad overtakes you. Um, and then here when we speak about Disney, you know, we've mentioned Disney many times. And of course people don't like this topic. It's like, dude, you know, Disney has great movies for the kids. You know, all these cartoons for the kids, very educational. Their English proficiency has increased and has been enhanced greatly by The Little Mermaid and her friends in the sea and but we've mentioned many times you have do you really see do you are you aware of what's what message is being communicated in these movies disney specifically and then the rest of the clans shirk for sure kufr and shirk at the highest type magic huh everything has to do with magic you rub uh, what do you call it the fanus huh the dude comes out and gives you three wishes and then one guy pulled a prank, he said, the third wish, I would like you to come again. So he can have him for a long time. And what kind of nonsense? This is, by the way, these are how our kids work. So now, you know, you go, they go with you to the supermarket, they, they want to get some, some Twix, and you say no. He starts thinking about, where's this fanus? Well, rub him, come out, uh, the ghost or whatever, the spirit, bring me a half a box, uh, three boxes, because my father's not buying it for me. And the kids, you know, kids are silly. They, they, these things grow in their mind. And you only find out when he's 40 years old that this is what he used to think for 20 years of his life. These things are ingrained in their minds. Of course, disobedience of parents. You know, this is all over these Disney movies. The Little Mermaid, what is The Little Mermaid? It's a half-naked girl, sorry. Half-naked, running away from her father to meet her lover on land. That's what it is. Your kids absorb this junk. Say, oh, it's okay, it's just a Disney, I just want to introduce him to this so they will know that these things exist. No, Habibi, these things don't exist unless you bring him into existence. And then, you know, girls at some age run away from home. She feels, and she doesn't even connect it with the Little Mermaid. Not, not at all. But, khalas, she's brainwashed. Her father doesn't want her to marry Fulan, she wants to marry Fulan. Then, you know, how many people just run away with the man? 
The girl will run away with the man, ignore her father, her mother who raised her and invested into her their whole lives. She will sell him for, you know, an onion ring and go with Fulan, who will eventually, of course, throw her out and then she will run back to them and they will say, Ma'alesh, yani, you came a little too late, Tfaddali, go live outside. These messages are brainwashed. The kids are brainwashed with these Disney movies. Illicit relations, lying, cheating, nakedness, you name it. And there isn't a single, as far as I know, from my memory, a single Disney movie that is an exception to the rule. Except that these things are, they seep them into, into the, the, the script. The minimum, which is the worst. If, you, if, you're, if it's subtle, shirk, at least shirk and kufr all over the thing. If you say, well, Allah, there's this one movie where there are no girls, no nakedness. Or if you want to be funny, you will eventually find something that has to do with magic or, or, or shirk and kufr. And without you realizing it, this is what the kids are absorbing. So you can't put your kids and allow them to watch everything on TV and say, Ma'alish, they will manage. No, Habibi, they will not manage. They will get a messed up mind eventually. And then you want to resolve the issue once they're 10, 11, they started reaching teenage. You say, hey, hey, we need to have a talk. Talk about what? Khalas, Habibi, it's too late. Five, six, seven years of this stuff, I'm done. And no matter what you do, unless Allah wills to change that person instantly, it becomes mission impossible to fix it. It's because of this ideology of how to, you know, take it easy, we can avoid the bad. We'll, we'll take the good. There are many good lessons in these cartoons. So we, the, the child is supposed to manage to take the good and leave the bad. Come on. That doesn't happen. The Prophet ﷺ said, Each one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for those under his care. The father with his family and the mother with her family, with the household. So it is our responsibility as parents to make sure that we provide them with the safe environment in which they can grow Islamically. No, no one is perfect. But we have to make that effort. This ideology of, it's okay, let me expose them to all types of evil and say the kids will figure it out. Kids will often lean towards evil. Easy for them to lie. Easy for them to cheat. Easy for them to steal. You know, the shaitan beautifies these things. So if we don't manage it from the beginning, it will be too late. That is that message. Uh, they also use another narration to support their stance, which is the hadith of Hudayfa. It's a famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. He said that the people used to ask the Prophet Sallallahu about Al-Khayr. And I used to ask him about evil, Makhafatan and Yudrikani. I used to ask about evil because I was afraid it, will go, it was going to affect me. It was going to take me over, take over me. So they say, look, Hudayfa, radiallahu anhu, was asking about evil in order to know how to deal with it and manage it, right? Supposedly, they say this hadith supports that it's okay. You, you need to know about the evil. And there's a difference between asking about the evil and learning from a scholar, from the Prophet ﷺ directly, and between going, jumping into this evil and say, let me try to swim out of it without getting wet. The irony is that Hudayfa himself refutes that understanding in another narration that has to do with fitan, wherein he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, tribulation will be presented to the hearts of people like a reed mat woven stick, stick by stick. And any heart afflicted by them will have a black mark put into it. Every time a fitna comes, it will leave that black mark, like, like you know, the mat, straw mat. Thus, there will be two kinds of heart. One is pure like a white gemstone, and it will not be harmed by any turbulation as long as the heavens and earth endure. And the other is black and dusty like a worn out vessel, neither recognizing good nor rejecting evil, but rather immersed in his desires. And the hadith is a Muslim. So every time, yes, I'm sorry, I, I forgot one part, but my heart, that uh, whenever, whenever it is presented, whenever it's presented to the fitan, if you reject it, it will leave a white dot, white mark. If you absorb the fitan, it would leave a black mark until you reach either a completely pure white heart or the opposite. So from this hadith we understand 
that whenever these trials and tribulations are presented, we are supposed to resist. Because if you don't resist, it's going to leave that mark. And then it will leave another mark, and another mark, and another mark, until that person now becomes completely heedless, clueless about the good and bad. They will no longer even see evil. They see evil that doesn't concern them. You know, when you see something bad, something foul, something haram, it's supposed to bother you. It, it doesn't bother them anymore. They find it maybe fun, halal, entertaining, whatever, entertaining, whatever you want to call it. But they lose that sense of jealousy over the deen. It's because of absorbing a large number of fitan. So this is for the sahaba worried about that. What about these children? Do you think they're going to be able to differentiate between the good and the bad and, and leave it alone? It's almost impossible. And this is further supported by another hadith wherein uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrated from the Prophet sallallahu where he said, there will come a time when the best wealth for the Muslim will be some sheep which he looks after in the tops of the mountains and the bottoms of the valleys. And this hadith, huh? He runs away with his deen from these trials and tribulations. He was speaking about والسلام, the end of time. They will reach a time where you, for you to avoid all of these tribulations, you're better off being far away from engaging with them. Your money is nothing but some sheep that you sell, some goats that you have in the mountain as a shepherd, because engaging with these fitan is going to overwhelm you. And now we bring it to the kids. Or to ourselves and say, no, no, we will manage, brother. We will take the good and leave the bad. I will swim, but won't get wet. That was the first. Now comes the calamity. The first one is still, sins and desires is, is, is an aspect that falls under maghfirah. And we all have high hopes in Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah to forgive all of us and all the Muslims all over the world. No matter what, how off we go, there's still hope that this is a ma'asiyah between me and Allah and then it falls under the maghfirah of Allah. So it's manageable. Believe it or not, as bad as it sounds, it's manageable. Why? Tawbah erases it. One of us says, khalas, you know what? I've done too many silly things. I'm done. I'm not going to do it again. If you are sincere, Allah will erase all the past. Done. Promised by Allah. Allah is even happy when we do this. So we don't have to worry much about that. Where does the issue happen when it's a matter of aqidah? This is where the calamity strikes the hardest. The examples and facts are ample in this regard, and it is heartbreaking to say the least. The manifestation of this lies in the idea that I can take knowledge from anyone, and all I have to do is take the good and leave the bad. This also applies when certain Muslims intentionally or unintentionally visit deviant websites supposedly to browse out of curiosity, only to have all types of doubts cast on them, and then they run to help. They want someone to help them get out of trouble. And I will give you some examples in a little bit, inshallah. Because what happens is, this happens a lot. You know, WhatsApp, the, the disadvantages of WhatsApp, we gave a lecture about it, we're not going to repeat it, is the fact that anybody can add you. So you get just random messages. And one of the most common messages is, by some number, somewhere in the West, more often than not, is brother, uh, I was giving da'wah to this Christian, for example, or to this atheist or whatever, and I went to this website that they had this kind of you know, debate and going back and forth, and, and they said something that in the Quran, it mentioned that you know, the heavens and earth were, were created in four days, but then another ayah says six days. Or so to, to, somehow they twisted the whole thing, and now the brother himself is what? Confused. And then they want you to figure it out for them. Now imagine if I didn't figure out for them or whoever else they contacted. What do you think will happen next? The shaitan, he went to give da'wah now, he received da'wah to the Jahannam. And the guy doesn't know how to get himself out of trouble. Even though it's a very basic explanation. The most basic of explanations, anyone who is involved in da'wah knows this is one of the easy misconceptions about Islam. That the non-Muslims try to bring about certain ayat which according to them are contradicting. And they're not. They simply don't know Arabic and they're reading some translation by I don't know who Pikthal or, or Yusuf Ali or someone. It is simply a misunderstanding of the ayat. Had it been a valid issue, then the kuffar of Quraysh would have raised it way back. It's a matter of calculation. Or understanding that this is four days for the heavens and earth, two days for the heavens. It's a very simple thing. I don't want to bring the cast or the doubt to you in case you don't know it either. But the bottom line is this happens all the time. 
They give da'wah to atheists, they get confused, they want to fix it. Oh, let me go to a website about the Shia. They go read a couple of things, then they come back and say, is it true? Is it true that the Prophet did this or Aisha did that? Ya Shaykh, ahda Allah yarda alayk. What are you doing over there anyways to begin with? What business do you have in this, ya Habibi? And to worry about yourself and do your salah and mind your business. Either you're qualified, so you go there, or you're not qualified, mind your business. Don't say, I'm going to go there and leave the bad. Very often, you don't leave the bad. The bad will destroy you. So you can't just listen to anybody and then say, I will figure it out. The evidence that they use, sadly, is the hadith of Abu Huraira. All of you know the hadith of Abu Huraira about the sabaka When he saw in his dream that he was, he was guarding the sabaka It was in Ramadan, if I remember correctly. And then the shaitan uh, came to him in a form of a man and he st stole from the sadaqa and uh, Abu Huraira, you know, tried to stop him, told him, Ana miskeen, something of the sort, Ma'alish, I have kids to look after. So Abu Huraira felt bad. This is in his dream. And he let him go. He told the Prophet Sallallahu and he told him that he is a liar and he will come back. And this next night, the, uh, Abu Huraira saw him again in the dream and he came again and he told him, did you not tell me you will not come? He said, Ma'alish, in the situation, my kids, I need them. I'm in a he felt bad for him and then he sent him a second time. And then the third time, then the, when the, the Abu Huraira decided he will not let him go anymore, he told him, look, I will teach you something. Huh? I will teach you something. If you say it, no shaitan will ever harm you until the morning. And he taught him ayat al-kursi. When he conveyed to the Prophet Sallallahu he told him, sabaqaka wa huwa kadub. He told you the truth even though he's a liar. He said, do you know who you've been speaking to for the last few days? He said, it is Iblis. So they say, well, the Abu Huraira learned from shaitan. So what's the problem if I listen to Fulan or Alan and without mentioning names right now, even though it's a perfect time to mention some names out there, but I'll, I'll, I'll maintain some decency for whatever reason. What's the problem with that, ya akhi? We'll, we'll take this and if you can learn from shaitan, you can learn from anybody who's less than shaitan. But we say, wait a second. First of all, did Abu Huraira know that he was learning from shaitan? No. So the identity was not known. The incident happened while Abu Huraira was unaware who that person was. And he only came to know at the end only when the Prophet ﷺ informed him. It is not like he willingly took knowledge from shaitan. Had he told him shaitan, probably in the dream it would have been a different ending. So bringing this hadith to support the principle of taking the good and leaving the bad never existed in the first place. Because Abu Huraira did not willingly know this is shaitan, I'm going to go learn under him. Or I'm going to listen to his lecture and then I will take the good and leave the bad. Come on! How are you going to compare this now to you listening to Fulan and say I will take the good and leave the bad? And really, can you do that? What are the qualifications of the average layman, the average Muslim who is on YouTube watching Fulan? What are your qualifications to be able to spot? Ah, 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 this one is bad. Okay, I will just delete this from my memory. Right? Because it's a file. I guess it's a zip file. And then you just kind of extract the whole thing, then you just go look for this file. Oh, that deleted, ma fi mushkila. No, ya habibi, you get the whole mumbo jumbo together. This is why our righteous predecessors, when one of the innovators said, I just want to recite an ayah, he said, La wallah, not even an ayah. If you stay here, I'm leaving. The student said, Ya Sheikh, if, what is the problem if this innovator recited an ayah? He said, I was afraid he would twist something in it. And it I would be misguided in the process. He might play with the words. Subhanallah, he wasn't trying to have it. It's a very tricky thing for you to say, I will listen, then I will figure it out. Because you will get the poison in the cake. Nobody's going to tell you, oh, by the way, this part of my lecture, just ignore. The, the first seven minutes are good, then three minutes, ignore. He's going to give you the whole thing. You are engaged. Huh? You, you can't differentiate. The average Muslim cannot differentiate. A speaker can differentiate with another speaker. A student of knowledge with a student of knowledge. A scholar with a scholar. But a regular Muslim with those, you can't. So therefore it is not allowed to say, Wallahi, I will listen to everybody and I will take the good and leave the bad. Because you simply cannot do it at this point. Now, it is a shame that one of these very famous speakers uh, made this statement publicly. He said, 
there are thousands of speakers, huh? there are thousands of sheikh. So, you cannot, you know, if somebody's going to tell you, don't listen to this guy, don't listen to that, then what are you going to do? He said, no, you listen to all of the sheikhs. And you take the good and you leave the bad. Hajib, yeah. He said, and how did he make the justification? He said, I've learned from everyone. I've learned from Jews. I've learned from Christians. And when you first hear it, you're like, oh, right? Like, brother, okay, fine. You Now you're telling us to listen to a deviant Muslim and sort it out. But now you're going to say Jews and Christians? Now, here's the funny part. He says, I've learned biology, science, mathematics from Jews. Ya Shaykh Allah Yahdiq, what? Now what does this have to do with this discussion right now? When you tell the Muslims that of course we've all learned from all types of teachers who are from any type of religion and any type of ethnicity and any type of gender, that's irrelevant. We learn from everybody. How are you going to bring that you learn math from a Jew and you benefit it into saying, well, now you can listen to the Muslim. He said, if I've learned from the Jew, then a Muslim, subhanAllah, I can't listen to a Muslim. Ya Shaykh, what kind of analogy is this? And this is belittling to the, the people get confused by the way. They're like, ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. La, 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 not so fast, Habibi. No, nobody ever said you can't learn. You, if you go to university, no, you go to Harvard and you meet with the principal from day one, say, listen, fire all the staff. I will only learn under Muslim teachers. Professors have to be Muslims. Get, get out of here, man. Are you out of your mind? We have professors. You either like it or you leave. And surely you will attend the university and learn under all types of people, learn everything with them, but not religion. Not religion. So you cannot use this example to justify listening to the thousands of sheikhs that are on, out there in the world and then you just have to, you know, take the good and leave the bad. And you see, the, the tricky part is people want to sell. Everybody wants to sell, even du'at, they want to sell. And for them to sell the product sometimes, which is Islam, they feel, some of them feel that Islam as is, is inadequate. Not uh, very pleasant. Not, let me do some modifications. Let me take out some things, add some things, you know, put a little spice into it, make it more manageable. Now we don't deny there's some way you can twist uh, uh, with a decent manner some things depending on your audience. I wouldn't even say twist. You can kind of, you know, put a different touch on them to make it more agreeable to the listener. But how are you going to give a lecture about the tafsir of Surah Taha? 138 minutes. An hour, sorry, 38 minutes. It's a long time. Surah Taha. And then somehow manage to skip all the ayat which have to do with Ar Rahman wa Ala Al Arsh istawa. You know the Surah Taha? Huh? In the beginning, Ala Tool it jumps into the issue of the names of Allah, right? And then it goes to the story of Musa. So in the minds of some of these speakers, look, Aqidah, nah. people don't like Aqidah. You speak about Aqidah so much, people will categorize you. Say, ah, he's one of those, ah, khalas, psh, I'm no longer a fan. I'm now a, an air condition. No, not even an air condition. I'm one of these, you know, things you weigh from a distance because the fan gives you too much coolness. So they want to exit. You cannot afford to lose all this audience. So let's just talk about manners. Let's talk about marital relations. Let's talk about wives, how to be good, da, 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 the whole thing. But issues of Aqidah and Tawheed, no, why? People don't show up to those. They've heard them too much. They're not really cool enough for the people. So I will give a whole talk about all kinds of interesting events that happen with Musa. But when it comes to the Allah's names and attributes and His majesty, no, no, leave that aside. Why? Because it will ruin it. And wallahi, nothing ruined anything except this. This approach of being ambiguous about where you stand is what has led all these Muslims to be confused. And so they don't know now what's good and what's bad. They listen to everybody because they have a hidden agenda. And we learned a lesson hard with our brother NAK. It's a classic example. Aqidah, ambiguous. 
but approach eloquence content quran mashallah the advice was tafaddalu ya jama'at al khair bismillah on the feast let's all learn and benefit couple of years five ten years bam surprise fix it now you give a whole lecture to resolve the matter and the result is nothing for the individual himself nothing at all no concern whatsoever for the followers some of them Allah guided the vast majority they just now labeled us again and they stuck to the man stuck to the man and they won't leave they will not leave and the situation gets worse huh with time it gets worse and more crazy things are being said more now making fun of the sahaba publicly in front of the people bulletin sahaba fabricated narrations lies against the messenger of allah you name it huh it only gets worse fix it now can't fix it listen to all the sheikhs and then take the good and leave the bad really akhi we have to make it clear to the people where we stand we have to be very clear then those who want to follow Allah will guide them to follow those who want to reject ما في مشكلة وما على الرسول إلا البلاغ المبين every person given da'wah he just communicates he's not going to grab your arm and say wallah you will come with me I can't you can't you want to come أهلا وسيرة want to come مع السلامة حبيبي but at least make it clear to the people what's up especially aqeedah why do we have to hide this issue of aqeedah and tawheed the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he, gave, when he came, did they have a problem with his manners? Did they have a problem with the issues? No. What was their problem? Their problem of Quraysh was what? Tawheed. Only Tawheed. This is their biggest issue was Tawheed. And in spite of that, the Prophet ﷺ for 13 years, he was doing nothing but giving da'wah to this Tawheed. Until it was instilled in the minds of the Sahaba. Then they were qualified. They were promoted to take Islam to the next level. We, if we can talk about being nice to your wife, trying to gain cookies with the ladies all the time, always trying to make the sisters happy. The man became the evil and the, the monkey and the crazy man, everything, and the sisters always the innocent one. Even though many of them are, are very off the track in terms of the, how to treat her husband and the rights Allah gave him and the Messenger of Allah. But now we can't even speak about those. Why? Because you're, you know, the feminine group among the sisters will get upset. Now you're, you know, siding with the brothers. So you have to do a lot of sugar coating to make the sisters happy. We don't have to do that. This is the rights of the man. This is the right of the woman. We have to maintain them. End of story, akhi. Say it as it is. So we talk about these topics all the time. And then when it comes to Tawheed, we sideline it. So we can continue have the, having these followers forever and ever. Until when? Until we take them where? What is the final destination? What is the end result? If the husband treats his wife like a queen and she treats him like a king and then both of them worship a dead man in the grave or they call on the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or they are on some other stuff in terms of the, the names and attributes of Allah what benefit is that gonna bring them did it benefit Abu Talib Abu Talib who protected all the Muslims our presence here the presence of Islam is a byproduct of Abu Talib looking after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in spite of that He's in Jahannam, as the hadith clearly states. Because, and the Prophet himself couldn't benefit him. He could not benefit him. Because the matter of Tawheed is one where there's no, this is why we were created, the Akhwan. This is the reason why we're here right now. How are you going to put this topic on the side and talk about other stuff? And then when people bring it up, you want to categorize them into something and then warn the people against them. And so you sound like the nice guy and everybody else, you know, they sound like the mean people. No, no, it's a matter of sincerity. It's a matter of keeping, keep sticking to the way of the Sahaba and the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But anyways, it's exactly as Allah told us because they are in the footsteps of those who preceded them. Allah says, وَإِذَا ذَكَرْتَ رَبَّكَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَحْدَهُ وَلَّوْ عَلَىٰ أَدْبَارِهِمْ نُفُورًا and when you, O Muhammad, make mention of your Lord alone, when you say, La ilaha illallah, in the Quran, they turn on their backs, fleeing in extreme dislikeness. They were absorbent to other ideas, other topics. But Tawheed, uh -uh, they can't deal with Tawheed. It's annoying. If someone is irritated by the topic of Tawheed and Aqeedah, this is a disaster because this is exactly what the disbelievers did at the time of the Prophet. 
They had no issue dealing with him, doing business with him, trade, marrying, and giving their daughters in marriage. All types of transactions were taking place. But the matter of Aqidah, no, this is where they, had their, they held their ground. But subhanAllah, it is not shocking either. The celebrity speakers who continuously mock Aqidah and Tawheed, look down upon it or set it aside, brush it off as unimportant, are a manifestation of the Hadith in Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will not deprive you of knowledge after He has given it to you, but will be taken by taking it away. Huh? But will be taken away through the death of the scholars. It will not be taken away just like that. Knowledge will not be given to you then extracted for no reason. How does it disappear? Huh? By the scholars. The scholars will die. Then they will remain ignorant people who when consulted will give verdicts according to their opinions whereby they will mislead others and go astray. That's the bottom line. You don't ask a scholar who's grounded in knowledge, when you ask him about a matter of Tawheed, he doesn't tell you, yeah, Shaykh, forget about this. Let's talk about the Muslims doing drugs. Why do you think the Muslim was doing drugs? Because he didn't know Allah. If he knew Allah, he wouldn't do drugs. If you stop him from drugs, then what? Is that going to bring him back to Allah? No. His issue to begin with was not knowing who Allah was. If you instill Iman in him, this, this is the only power that will be able to convert him from the wrong path to the right path. Knowing Allah, this is what Islam does. So you ask a scholar, he will tell it to you flat. When Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know that this, that, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَمِّكَ Then you can seek forgiveness for your sin. First, know لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ but we see today, don't worry about that. Where Allah is, it's not important. The Sahaba didn't ask this frequently. Let me give you another solution. And they get you into this zigzag. People get lost in the process. Let me tell you how the method of the Prophet ﷺ was. If you want to know the value of Tawheed and Aqidah and the life of a Muslim, as per the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the reciting Surah Al-Ikhlas is equivalent to one-third of the Quran, Allahu Akbar. Surah Al-Ikhlas, how many ayat? Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. What is the theme of the surah? What is the subject of the surah? Allah, Tawheed, Allah alone, period. There isn't any subject matter besides that. That is equal to one third of the Quran, if you recite it. Why? Because this is what the deen is about. Why is Ayatul Kursi Ayatul Kursi? Because the whole surah is about who? Allah. It's the greatest ayah in the Quran. Ayatul Kursi. Coincidence? No way. The core purpose of sending messengers, messengers was to invite the people towards Tawheed and war against Shirk. As we know in many ayat. The Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. Instructing him to teach Tawheed first to the people. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also made learning Tawheed a condition to, lead, to learn other things. As he said, if they learn that Tawheed, call him to La ilaha illallah. If they adhere, if they conform to La ilaha illallah, then tell them that Allah has enjoined upon them five daily prayers. Subhanallah. Clear, the, the Quran and the Sunnah are clear cut. There's no going around, there's no beating around the bush. You have to first learn Tawheed. Once you've understood that, then you can pray now. So your prayer will be of benefit. But today we go call for prayer first. Then Tawheed, ah, Shaykh, forget about Tawheed. You don't need to know Tawheed. Allah mawjood. We like to simplify. Allah is there. Really, ya Shaykh. Do you think the kuffar of Quraysh believed Allah was there? No, they had a, a more firm belief than that. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and earth, they will say Allah. They knew more than just Allah was there. But it didn't benefit them. Because there was no real la ilaha illallah. And the hadith, uh, the authentic narration in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, that the Sahaba said, we, first, we were first taught about Iman before we were taught the Qur'an. And we mentioned this in a lecture before. 
They first learned Iman. What is Iman? And to mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubi wa rusuli wa liyum al akhir wa to mina bil qadari khairi wa sharri. To believe in Allah and His angels and His messengers and His scriptures and believe in the last day and to believe in preordainment, the good and the bad thereof. They first learn Iman, then Quran. Because what is the benefit of the Quran if you don't have Iman? Bring any Christian Jew, let him read the Quran from cover to cover the whole Ramadan, 20 times. At the end of the day, he doesn't believe in Muhammad sallallahu Is that going to benefit him? Absolutely not. It's actually proof against him. So we want to teach the people the Quran, but when it comes to the matter of Tawheed, shh, it doesn't sell. It doesn't sell. Language sells. Quran sells. Stories, storytelling, beautifying stuff. Oh, it sells a lot. Bring a lot of people. Tawheed, mm -mm. keep it on the side. What, what da'wah will succeed? Or for how long? It will not be long before it dies out. But the message of some of the du'at, and I'm speaking in the English language, who had focus on Tawheed, their material is heard and benefited from until today. Because it dealt with what brought people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just to prove to you that the Sahaba were on the same page, and we're almost there inshallah, that manners and good character and all this stuff is beautiful and dandy, but it's not going to be of benefit without Aqeedah. Abdullah ibn Umar said, if any one of them, because people came and said to him, there are some people who don't believe in Qadr, the Qadariyah. He said, if any one of them who does not believe in the divine, divine decree, had with him gold, Huh? equal to the bulk of the mountain of Uhud and spent it in the way of Allah, Allah will not accept it unless he affirmed his faith in Qadr. This is Ibn Umar. Uh, spend a mountain of gold, sabaka. If you don't believe in Qadr, Allah will not accept it from you. And now you speak about Qadr to some Muslims, they're like, Qadr, wait. Lucky seven, ya akhi, or what? Umbrella in the house, I cannot open it. Salt fell on the floor, musiba. Let me see what the uh, zodiac, you know, Capricorn. What is my luck for next week? What are you talking about? This is all shirk, all types of kufr and shirk right there. All types of examples of superstitious beliefs that people have today. They don't understand the concept of qadr. And if you don't know qadr, it's not going to benefit. And the same applies to the other articles of faith. Anyways, lastly, for those who like to, uh, lastly before we conclude, for those who like to browse, as I was given the examples earlier, please relax. Do not go to fishy websites that have bogus, ambiguous information and say, I will only take the good and leave the bad. We all know the hadith when uh, Umar had, had a sheet, a scripture of the Torah. And he was reading it. It was given to him by a Jew and he was reading it with the intention of adding knowledge. If these are people of the book, Allah mentioned them in the book and he commanded to, to follow the scripture. So he had that intention of additional knowledge. And what did the Prophet ﷺ do when he saw him? He said, are you in doubt? He became angry. Are you in doubt, O son of Khattab? Are you in doubt about what has been given to me? Had Musa been alive, he would have no choice but to follow me. So when someone was trying to just trying to browse and learn from other sources, the Prophet ﷺ, and this is Umar ibn al-Khattab, you know the Iman of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Khalifa. That was not an acceptable situation. This does not mean that if you get involved in da'wah, you cannot cite a biblical evidence. Because those who give da'wah to Christians and they cite the biblical evidence, they weren't reading the Bible trying to gain more iman or knowledge. They were trying to read it to refute. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah and others authored books citing all types of biblical verses. Because the intent was not, let me see what else is out there. No, let me see how I can guide them to Islam through their own source. That's a whole other ball game. But just to say, let me find elsewhere, this is, this is a no-no according to the Prophet ﷺ. So please, don't go to different websites if you don't have the proper qualifications because you're exposing yourself to fitna. And the, the, there isn't always someone who will get you out. Sometimes Allah decrees that someone explains to you adequately the situation, say, oh, alhamdulillah, I understand. Sometimes that person is non-existent. 
So you the shaitan will use this doubt for the rest of your life. Why? Don't go there. Don't go there. It's not your responsibility. Allah will not hold you accountable for it. Conclusion. No topic on Tawheed is complete except with warning against shirk. La ilaha illallah. It's in the, in the expression. You have to deny false gods. And no topic on Sunnah is complete except with warning against bid'ah. People say, don't, don't, ya akhi, just speak about Tawheed, how beautiful it is. Speak about the Sunnah, how beautiful. Don't talk about these topics that, you know, the people are afraid of and repel. Why? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work, ya akhi. Especially in this day and time. You have to make it clear what's right and what's wrong. You cannot speak about the Sunnah without warning against bid'ah. And no topic on Aqeedah is complete except with warning against the people of misguidance who have introduced no Aqeedah to the Muslims that is not in agreement with the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the four Imams which we all claim to follow. Their Aqeedah is unlike those who claim they, they, those who follow them in fiqh today do not follow them in the Aqeedah. Specifically Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. He was from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The real Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Today people of every type of Aqeedah, Maturidi and Ash'ari and Mu'tazili and everybody claims to be a Hanafi. And Imam Abu Hanifa is innocent of them. Rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'ah. It is not the case that when you teach and talk about prayer, you also warn about nullifiers. When you speak about salah, don't you have to speak about the invalidators of salah? You have no choice. You teach people how to play, uh, pray. Sorry, you teach someone how to pray. Tab, what if someone, sorry, uh, let go of some, some gas in the salah? You let it go or you have to tell him this will nullify your salah, you have to go repeat, you have to make wudu. You have to teach them about the nullifiers. You teach him about tawheed, you have to teach him about the nullifiers. The sunnah, you have to teach him about the nullifiers. So the Prophet ﷺ, every Friday, almost every Friday, he would say to the people, every, every huh? misguidance, every muhdath, every newly introduced matter is an innovation, and every innovation will lead astray. And he told us in this hadith, when the Sahaba asked him for a sincere advice, and he gave them an admonishment so much so that they were crying. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, as if you're giving us a farewell advice, advise us. He said, I, I command you to listen and obey to the rulers. This is another message to the Khawarij. Listen and obey the rulers. Even if it's an Abyssinian, which back then they considered to be someone who's lesser than the rest. In Islam, we don't have this differentiation between white and black. Some people think this is supporting racism. It is not supporting racism. But back then, this was their mentality. It doesn't matter who's in charge. Listen and obey. And in other hadith, even if darabaka wa akhadha malik, even if he beats you and takes your money, give him his right. Allah will give you your right on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Don't go running your mouth and acting like some champ and some, some hero and some turn out to be a zero afterwards. And you bring absolutely no benefit to the ummah. A lot of the people will go in that direction. Then he said, whoever lives after me will see a lot of difference. What is the solution? Upon you is my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. Bite on it with your molar teeth. This is the way out. Not go to everybody, take the good and leave the bad. What were the Sahaba upon? I'm, I'm going to adhere to that strictly. What did they believe? I'm going to adhere to that strictly. This is the only way out. Anything else is bound to destroy us. So brothers and sisters, you cannot swim without getting wet. And you cannot go to the midst of evil be it in matters of sinfulness or matters of aqidah and knowledge and say, I will take the good and leave the bad. This principle has destroyed us. Because many people fall victim to it. They have good intentions, they go and it's almost like a wave, a big wave that comes and just takes them away. And they just go away. What we're supposed to do is protect ourselves, protect our children, create the proper environment, beg Allah and beseech Him for guidance and to keep us firm. And then if Allah decrees that our children are exposed to some evil of some type or wind up going astray, at least you can say to Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, I wasn't involved. I did everything I could to provide them with the healthy environment. If Allah decreed to misguide the person, Allah could. You know in Surah Al-Kahf, there's this one walad who Allah decreed that he will drive his parents out of Islam. So Allah told Al-Khadr to kill him. Right? It's the Qadr of Allah sometimes. But our responsibility is to maintain. Not throw them in the midst of it and say, let them, you know, work it out on their own. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us firm and to guide us. Hada wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam